apologies for the absolutely terrible quality of this, um, which is why I don't do very many of these when I'm talking to the camera. Um, while I was doing research for a video that I'm working on, uh, one of the primary sources I was going through, it dawned on me that uh, the 80th anniversary of the event being talked about are actually coming up and on the day that I'm going to be releasing this video. So rather than put it in a video that's going to be coming out much later, I did a little miniature one of this. Um, apologies for the quality. I did not have a lot of video that was appropriate to what I'm talking about to use, so I displaced in a bunch from the wrong Air Force and the wrong event uh, just to have something other than a slideshow of a few pictures to look at. Uh, but what you're about to hear is an excerpt from an interview given in 1989 by Lieutenant Herbert Hatch. Of the 71st Fighter Squadron, the first fighter group, the Beat Air Force, of the fight that took place on June 10th, 1944, 80 years ago. And um, I tried to put some video in a little bit of what he's talking about, just some stuff in the background stuff to look at, but it's mostly the after action report that I wanted to have as part of the video. So I'll explain more about it afterwards and put it into a little bit of context and talk about the video that led to the finding this little bit of information. In the meantime, enjoy this, and I'll explain a little bit more after we're all said and done. So here we go. This mission was flown on the 10th of June, 1944. The entire Air Force had been working on Ployeshti, but there was one particular part of it they'd not been able to damage seriously. That part was called the Romano Americana Refinery. It was a cracking tower where they actually made high-octane gas. For whatever reason, it seemed to lead a charmed life, and nobody was getting to it very well. So some bright guy down in Air Force headquarters decided, since the heavies couldn't do it from 25,000 feet, we'll send in the P-38s and let them dive bomb it from 10,000. That was the whole idea behind the mission, to get that particular target in the PlayHD complex. We were briefed that morning very early. As I recall, we got up about 4 o'clock had some little breakfast, and went down to group headquarters for the briefing. When we walked in and sat down, the 94th, 27th, and 71st, it became apparent that something unusual was in the air, because the group commander, the group intelligence officer, and all the brass of the group were at the briefing. And when they lifted the map and drew the line to play HD, all of us kind of went, uh huh? And then when they came up and told us what the mission was, my recollection was that there was absolute silence in the briefing area and utter disbelief on the part of all of us. That they were going to send us 600 some odd miles to surprise the Germans at Ployeshti and then dive bomb the target. In the course of the briefing, it became apparent that the 82nd Fighter Group was the one that was going to be doing the bombing and that the first had been selected for fighter escort. And you have no idea of the relief that went through the group when they found out they weren't going to be the ones carrying a 1,000-pound bomb on one side and a 360-gallon belly tank on the other and try and dive into all that flack. The weather was actually CAVU, not a cloud in the sky anywhere. Takeoff was perfectly normal. We took off shift 16 ships and 3 spares. There was no problem except in green flight. Standing on the dirt strip we had, you got all the dust from everybody else as they took off. We took off in four ship flights, four ship formation. We had no problem joining up with the 94th and 27th and heading out over the Adriatic. We rendezvoused with the 82nd Fighter Group right on schedule, and the orders for the mission were to go all the way in on the deck. And I mean on the deck. We hopped over the Yugoslav Mountains, and as soon as we got on the other side, the group leaders dropped the aircraft down to anywhere from 50 to 100, maybe 150 feet off the ground. Anyone who's flown formation at low level knows the difficulty in keeping a squadron together, 16 aircraft, let alone three squadrons and a group of 48 and two full groups of nearly 100 aircraft. It's pretty tough to keep any kind of formation with two and a half to three quarters, two and three quarter hours on the deck. We hit our IP right on time. There was a small lake south of Bucharest and made our turn to the north as we were instructed to do. And at that point, we were supposed to have dropped our belly tanks and climbed for altitude to get over the, and escort the 82nd into the target area. But as we made our turn, we flew right over an enemy airfield. And in the airfield landing pattern, there were about four or five Dornier transports. Our squadron leader turned and went after him. No fighter pilot can turn down a target like that, although subsequent events proved that he sure as hell should have. 
our original 90 left with north heading actually turned out to be another 60 degrees left. And when we made that sharp turn to the left, we lost one of our flights. Our blue flight did not make the turn to go chase the transports in the pattern. I want to emphasize at this point that we were no more than maybe 250, 300 feet off the ground. The transports didn't last long. I wasted some ammunition by firing at one of them at the tail end of from the tail end of it, and I wished later that I hadn't shot him. But as we went by and pulled up off the airfield and turned back to the north again, somebody hollered, Cragmore, break left for Christ's sake. I looked off to my left, and there's a whole flock of 190s coming in from 9 o'clock. As the squadron broke left and as I started to make my turn, one of the 190s pulled right across in front of me. He was so close that in my ring sight, all I could see was the belly of his fuselage and the wing root. I opened fire, and I just damn near blew him in half. And that saved my neck, because when I rolled out to shoot on that particular 190, I looked up to my right, and here came another bunch of them in from 2 o'clock. Of the bunch coming in from 2 o'clock, there were four. I did the only thing I could do. I turned right sharply, pulled up, and opened fire again, and set the lead 190 on fire. The other three went right over my head and down on the flight leader and number two's tail. They both went in. I continued to turn on another around to my right with my wingman still with me. And as I turned, I saw another Fock Wolf driving right up behind one of my tent mates who was white four. I started shooting at him and set fire to him, shot his canopy off, but it was too late. Joe Jackson was already on fire, rolled over, and went in. I was still turning to the right, going quite slow because I was a very low altitude. I had combat flaps down and turned maybe another 90 degrees to my right when I saw another one of our P-38s coming head-on with a 190 right on his ass. I pulled up a little and opened up on the 190 head-on, and I can remember thinking to myself in the cockpit, I can hold as long as you can, you German son of a bitch, and I shot the bottom half of his engine off. He nosed down shooting at me, and I had to dump the stick hard to miss him. He went over me, but not by more than about three feet, and part of his right wing caught my left rudder and knocked about three inches off the top of the vertical stabilizer. Something went over my head when I saw three more making a pass at me from my left, and I turned so fast that I lost my wingman. I missed my shot at that time, but when they went over me, I saw another one diving on one of our 38s and shot at him from about a 90-degree deflection. I hit his left wing, shredded the aileron, and fell off on his wing and went in. We were so low, there was no chance for him to recover. I kept going on around to my left, shot another one who was going away from me on my left. I knocked a bunch of pieces off his cowling and fuselage, but I never did have time to find out what happened to him. About then I looked up at 2 o'clock and here comes another one right at me shooting for all he's worth. It was too late for me to turn, I just shut my eyes involuntarily and hunched down in the cockpit. I remember thinking I'd bought the farm right there, but he missed me, God knows how or why. I was a sitting duck for sure, but he never even hit me. I think the reason for it was I was going so slow, he overestimated my speed and was overleading me. I started to turn his way when he went behind me, and I continued on around. There was another one out there, and I closed in on him, got set, and fired. My guns let go about ten rounds and quit. All the ammo was gone. I damaged him a bit, but he flew away. I cannot emphasize at this point enough what a melee that was. There were at least 24, perhaps more, P-38s in that area all at low altitudes, somewhere between 25 and 30, what we thought at the time were Fock Wolf 190s. None of us more than two, 300 feet off the ground, some of us lower than that. The ground itself was a kind of a little hollow with some hills on each side of it, and that was the wildest melee I've ever seen in the 60-odd combat missions that I flew. There were aircraft going in, both P-38s and 190s, all over the place. You could hear the radio even carried the gunshots, the guns firing at various targets. You could hear the yelling and shouting right over the radio. We had one guy evidently hit pretty bad, and I heard him scream all the way in. It was a wild, wild few minutes. And a few minutes is all it was. According to the mission report, the whole original fight took place somewhere in a period between three and six minutes. I had no idea of elapsed time, believe me. We were all too damn busy trying to stay alive. Up to this point, things had been going too hard and too fast for me or anyone else, I guess, to get to begin to get scared. But when I woke up to the fact that I was out of ammunition, 600 miles into enemy territory, and at that point, from what I could see, all by my little lonesome, then the sweat started. I broke out of the area, jumped over the hills, and went looking for some company. And in a couple of minutes, I found one of our squadron headed in my general direction, called him on the radio, and joined up with him. About that time, I heard my wingman start hollering for some help, saying that he was on single engine and pretty badly shot up. Would somebody please come back and help him? 
So the man with whom I joined up and I turned back looking for him. Finally picked him up down at about 200 feet and headed him out. Right in the direction we were already headed and started to climb out of there and head west. Joe, my wingman's airplane, looked like a lace doily. The two that I hadn't had time to turn into had gone right over the top of me and down on his tail because he had broken right when I broke left. And it was flying, but just barely. And Hoy, the other chap from the 71st I joined up with, was out of ammunition, same as I. So the three of us just tried to make ourselves as small as possible and headed west. We hadn't gone more than, oh, another four or five minutes when another P-38 joined up with us, this chap from the 94th Squadron. And we were happy to see him, hoping he had some ammunition, but we found out very shortly that his radio was out and we couldn't talk to him. We'd gone maybe 20, 25 miles west trying to climb and get a little altitude and we ran into a bunch of flak. And we lost Joe again because he couldn't maneuver as quickly as we could to get out of the mess. So we had to turn around and go back and get him yet again. We nursed him along for a long, long time. We got out of Romania into Yugoslavia and had climbed to oh, about 10, 12,000 feet. We were weaving back and forth over Joe because he couldn't fly as fast as we could on only one engine and shot full of holes. And as I turned on one of the S's, I took a look back at about 8 o'clock and spotted six 109s. I hollered at Hoy, bogey's high at 8 o'clock. He saw him immediately and said, hold it, hold it. Joe hit the deck. Joe didn't waste any time. He stuck the nose straight down and headed for the deck. We held the turn as best we could, and when they broke, we came in from 6 o'clock turning up into them, hoping to scare them off like we were ready for a fight, but they didn't scare worth a damn. And Hoy, who was leading the flight at the time, hollers over his radio, hit the deck, Hatch! And I didn't waste any time doing that either. I rolled it over and on its back and split us right out of there. With a 109 chasing me, a couple of them I went after Hoy. I don't know where the others went. There was an undercast beneath us, and I didn't have the faintest idea what the hell was under there. Yugoslavia is full of mountains, but there was no choice at that point. This guy's chasing me, and I had nothing else to fight with, so I went through that undercast so fast I couldn't even see it. I must have been hitting, as I recall, I was close to 600 miles an hour indicated when I came out of the clouds, and I came out in a valley between two ridges. The Lord was sure as hell with me that day. I kept going and pulled back up over the cloud layer when I figured I'd lost him and started looking around for Hoy or Joe or anybody else. I heard Joe hollering for help, but my gas was getting to the point where I couldn't afford to turn around and go back, so I headed back for Fajia and home. When I landed back at our base, Fajia 3, it was at that point the first and, as it turned out, only member of the flight to come back in from the mission. And as you can well imagine, there was quite a welcoming committee at the revetment when I parked the aircraft. Shortly after I landed, Blue Flight came in intact, all four of them. Later in that afternoon, the squadron leader and his wingman, who was my tent mate, came back in and landed at our strip. They'd gotten as far as a little island off the coast of Yugoslavia known as Viz, which had been held by a bunch of British commandos and was a staging field if people ran out of gas. They went in there, refueled, and came back to Faja. It might be of interest to note that my elapsed time on the mission was 6 hours and 55 minutes, and I don't think I had enough gas to make another pass at the airfield, even if I hadn't made it in on the first approach. Much later that evening, long after debriefing and after a little of that so-called medicinal alcohol that the flight surgeon was kind enough to dish out, who should come wandering into the tent in the little officer's pub we had in there but Joe, my wingman. He'd gotten that lace doily of his across the Adriatic as far as it would fly, dumped it on the beach at Barry, Italy, hitched a ride in an army 6x6, six six, and walked back into the squadron that evening. And to say we were glad to see him was one hell of an understatement. So I'm going to try recording this one on my phone in the hopes the audio is a little bit better. Um, if you see in that, he talks about shooting down five German Focke Wolf 190s in this massive fight over Romania in June of 1944. Uh, those of you that know 15th Air Force history or knowing the videos that I normally do and what I tend toward, uh, he later on in the interview admits, but I will give him credit for telling the story as it occurred at the time not with information he found out later. Uh, those were not German Focke-Wulf 190s he was fighting. They were, in fact, uh, IAR-80 and 81 fighters of Grupo Chasse Venatoire, the sixth fighter group of the Royal Romanian Air Force. And despite the fact that he claims to have shot down five and was given credit for, as you can see in the photos of the plane afterwards, he has the five kill markings, uh, he's officially listed as an ace in the day from that engagement. The Romanians only acknowledged three of the IARs having been shot down in the entire fight. 
that basically destroyed the first fighter group, uh, or at least scattered it pretty well, as you see. Um, I'll get into from their side, because the video that I'm working on where I came across that, trying to find a little bit more primary information on some of the combat of the IAR-80, is a historic, or uh, I should say overview history of the IAR-80 and 81 series of aircraft that I've been working on. It has taken me quite a while. I'm still putting it together. I have to do this in between working a full-time job and having kids and everything else. I don't make any money doing these videos. I just enjoy doing them. So hopefully eventually before too long that video will be coming out and we'll get to hear about the battle from the other side, put it in more context. However, it is his account. I'm not criticizing him at all. It is a perfect example of the confusion of battle and how so many uh, pilots in a fight will overclaim on both sides and everything else. I mean, the Romanians claimed more P-38s killed from one of the sources that I found than were actually involved in the fight, so it went both ways. But there you go. There's one side of the story, and eventually you'll be hearing the other side.